you guys are baseball fans on last week you saw the results of the World Series Texas Rangers won their first World Series and see a lot of smiles so I suppose that was a good thing for a lot of people who are native Texans of course if you know anything about baseball pitchers throw various types of pitches and sometimes they throw what is called a changeup and I mentioned that because throwing you a change up on this morning what I intended to preach what I studied to preach uh, some circumstances uh, dictate at least in my mind that it made me preach something a little bit different than what I wanted to initially so you understand what that means a little bit later on as we progress in the book of Luke chapter 19 and verse number 10 Jesus Christ is speaking to a man by the name of Zacchaeus and he says that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Are you guys turning there? And that's great. Don't want to spend a whole lot of time in that text. We wanted to be able to latch on to verse number 10 to allow it to formulate a thought uh, that is going to catapult us into where uh, we're going to be this morning. The text was read from the book of Luke in the 15th chapter, verses number 11. Verse number 21. So we'll look at verses 11 through verse number 24 in particular from Luke chapter 15. But Christ says that I come to seek and save the lost. A lot of times, whenever we take a look at the 15th chapter of the book of Luke and we begin in verse number one and we see these parables that our Lord will teach. Number one, the parable of the lost sheep. Then in the second place, the parable of the lost coin. A lot of times, when we look at that particular part of that text and, and what we deem that text to be about is. The recovery of the loss, our responsibility to recover the loss. And certainly not saying that that is not a thought that can be der derived from that particular text, and that's not an application that needs to be made. But whenever we look at that text in particular, and we understand the, the context of what is going on there, we need to realize that it's more about our response to those who have repented than it is about the recovery of those who are lost. And so we talk about the recovery of the loss, and we know, again, Jesus Christ said, that's what I come to earth to do. I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. And, of course, he's talking to a publican. I believe that bears some, some relevance to what we are looking at here, because in the outset of this context is the fact that Jesus Christ is, is preaching and teaching. And the Bible says publicans and sinners came to hear him teach. But the Pharisees and the scribes, they murmured and complained about the fact that he had received publicans and sinners. During his ministry, of course, over there, it's the last week of his life and on earth. And, and these Pharisees and these scribes are looking back at what Christ had done while he's on this earth. And they uh, have witnessed the fact on many different occasions that it was certainly within the realm of what Christ wanted to, to do was to be able to sit down with people who were lost, to be able to teach them, to be able to give them the gift of life through the proclamation of the truth that they needed. That's what he came for. That's what he was here for. If men did not need to be saved, then Christ would have had no reason to even come. And so he's come to seek and save that was lost. And there's times and occasions where the Pharisees and the scribes, they would complain about that. And, and Christ would appeal to logic as he often did. And he would say on one particular occasion, look, it's not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. And so in other words, helping them to understand this is why I'm, I'm here. You're complaining about the fact that I'm with this crowd of people for the sake of trying to help them. But look... If I'm a physician, then it stands to reason it makes sense that I spend time with those who are sick. And if you think that you're well, then you know that probably helps you to understand why I spend more time with them than with you. And so you go back to the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. And again, Christ is dealing with that same mindset. He's dealing with that same mindset. Even toward the end of his ministry, he's still contending with the fact that this is the way that they thought. They had set themselves up as the shepherd of the people. The Pharisees and the scribes did, but they didn't care anything about recovering lost sheep. And so Christ has come to seek and save that which is lost. Whenever he begins to talk about these things in these three parables that he tells, again, he's talking to the Pharisees and the scribes and anyone else who would be reluctant to receive those who, upon hearing the truth, are willing to repent 
and receive the salvation that Christ has to offer. That's who he's talking to. Whenever you look at some of the key verses in this particular passage of Scripture, before we get into the text that we really want to delve into, the unit of thought that is going to be our consideration on this morning, if you will be mindful, beginning in verse number 4 of this parable of the lost sheep, there's a hundred sheep that, uh, that this shepherd has. The Bible says that if one of them is lost, he leaves the 99 and he goes out to recover that one that is lost. We understand that, right? And again, what it is that we oftentimes get out of this passage is, look, if we have a hundred sheep in our fold and one of them is lost, we need to go out and to recover that one sheep. And again, I'm not saying that you can't get that out of this passage, but notice what the, what the emphasis really is. Notice verse number six. The Bible talks about this sheep that's lost, and when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and his neighbors, talking about the shepherd that went out to find this lost sheep, saying unto them, Rejoice with me. For I found my sheep, which was lost. There's your emphasis. Come and rejoice with me. How do I know that's the emphasis? Because when he gets to the next parable, he's going to say the same thing. It's another parable dealing with another thing that is lost as a coin. But notice there in verse number 9, when she has found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me, for I found that peace which I lost. Come and rejoice with me, the shepherd says, when he finds his sheep. Come and rejoice with me, the woman says, whenever she finds her lost coin. Whenever this father loses his son that we read about, beginning there, at verse number 11, at the end of the day, you go down to the last verse of this beautiful chapter. And verse number 32 gives you the key thought. This is the thematic thrust of this entire chapter. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost, was lost, and is found. There's your thrust. There's your thrust. It behooves us whenever we study a passage of Scripture to make sure that we truly dig out the thematic thrust, the big idea of the text. And, and without a doubt, that is the big idea of this text. Whenever someone is lost and whenever God has been merciful to that someone, whenever God has extended enough love and long suffering to that one to allow them the space to repent and to come back home, then it's incumbent upon all of us, all of us to receive that one back with open arms. The older brother in this parable is what God is trying to help us to steer clear of. You know, a lot of times whenever you look at the text of the Bible, God shows you the good, the bad, and the ugly, if you will. He shows us human behavior. That's one of the ways we know that the Bible is from God. Because God doesn't try to glamorize everything that man does. Of course, we would. If we were writing this, we'd try to glamorize everything that we had done and anything that we had done that was not glamorous. Well, we would simply omit that. We know that's the case because you see it so much whenever you look at the historical annals of the conquest and the kingships of different men. But God shows us everything. He tells us, look, here's an example that you need to avoid. Here's something that you do not need to emulate. You don't need to emulate this older brother. He's represented representative of the scribe and the Pharisees who were not willing to receive one back who was lost. We need to be those who emulate the Father and are willing to receive back and to rejoice over those that are lost. And so that is the thrust of this text. Now with all that said, what I want us to look at, beginning there at verse number 11 and going down to verse number 24, is the fact that we see what repentance entails here. We see what repentance entails. See, we got this younger son again. We're familiar with the text. We know that there's uh, this younger son and that he goes to his father and he tells his father, look, I want you to give me my inheritance. And of course, the father is not angry with him. He doesn't, doesn't buck, he doesn't rebut him. But the Bible says he simply divides the inheritance among his two sons. He gives it to them. And then, of course, we know the Bible tells us that this younger son, that he would take his inheritance. He would go to a far country and he would squander. He would waste all that he has. That's why we call this the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son. The word prodigal is not there necessarily, but we understand it's a word that means wasteful. It means wasteful. And so he would go and waste everything that his father had given him, the Bible says in verse number 13, with riotous living. So he goes and becomes engaged in all manners of, of riotous living. We can conjecture what all is involved there. His older brother does. Whenever he gets back, he conjectures that he has spent his money on, on prostitutes and, and, and things like that you know, in the riot. 
We don't conjecture. The Bible says he spent his money in riotous living. We know there are all types of things that fall into that category that probably he was involved in. And the Bible says in verse number 14, And when he had spent all there, arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his field to feed swine. And we, he would have fain filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And so I've heard this passage of Scripture preached many times in my life, and generally a lot of times a preacher will make a to-do out of the fact that this was uh, no doubt a young Jewish man, and, and for him to be in a position where he's got to feed swine was certainly degrading. And then certainly when we look at the fact that he is about to eat of the husk that he's feeding the swine, well, that is absolutely atrocious. And so probably a good observation that is made. But what we want to get to are the components of repentance. See, the beautiful thing about this story is that this man repents, that he, he finds himself a recipient of the grace of God, and he's got space to repent. What all is involved in that repentance? Sometimes we look at the concept of repentance as a biblical concept. Brother John talks about it often. Whenever he preaches, I talk about it as well, and the other elders do also. We mentioned to you before that there's generally two words in the Greek language that are translated into the English repentance. One of those is metanoes, and literally that comes from two Greek words, meta or meta, which can mean a change or a metamorphosis is kind of one of the words that derives from that. Metanoes, and that's noes is, is the mind, or noes is the mind. And so literally it's a change of mind, but then you have also the word epistrepho, which literally means a change or turnabout of behavior. In Acts chapter 3, verse number 19, you find Peter utilizing in both of those words in his preaching. And so we come to understand what the words are in the Greek language and we understand what it means. I like places like the book of Isaiah chapter 55. It also gives you a very beautiful definition of what repentance is. If you want to turn over there real quickly, take a quick look there in Isaiah chapter 55 and notice there in verse number 7, matter of fact, back up to verse number 6 to get the full thought. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Listen to this. Verse number seven. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. So this is the days of Judean apostasy. And through the preaching of the prophet Isaiah, God is begging and pleading with the Judeans. Look, just turn back to God. Forsake your ways. Forsake your thoughts. And return to God. And again, that's a beautiful definition of repentance. He will be mercy and he merciful, excuse me, and he will receive you. And so we see the definitions. Whenever we begin to break repentance down, what all is involved? What actually does it look like? And this is a beautiful text of scripture back in Luke chapter 15. It helps us to understand what things are involved. What are the components of true biblical repentance? We need to make sure that we understand this. Whenever we see this young man, here's what we see him do. Number one, we see a restoration of senses. Verse number 17a. We see a restoration of senses. So whenever it is that we have stepped away, we are children of God, and we are living our lives in accordance with the will of God, having been, again, o- obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches us sometimes that men will step away. We see many examples of this. Paul talked about Demas, in fact, lamented over Demas and the fact that he had gone back into the world. We see uh, the uh, Simon the Sorcerer over in the book of Acts chapter 8. Here's someone who obeys the gospel of Jesus Christ and very soon returns to the previous thoughts that he had of covetousness prior to obedience to the gospel. And, of course, he's got to repent. That's what Peter encourages him to do. We look at people who have literally stepped outside of, of a right frame of mind. Notice with me in the book of Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter there, Peter is talking about the false, uh, false teachers here in the book of Second Peter. Remember in chapter 1 of Second Peter, what Peter has been doing is he's been looking at the, the faith that we practice. The faith of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he tells us that our faith should be identical to that of the apostles in the first place, verses 1 through verse number 4. He tells us that that faith ought to be solidified through diligent growth, verse number 5, the verse number 15, and the verse number 16 and following. He tells us that faith is built upon a verified Savior. 
a verified Savior, and a verified Word from God. And so we consider that last point there. And Peter says in verse number 19, we also have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as of unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation, for prophecy came not... In old time by the will of man, but holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now you get into verse number one of chapter two, and it's a continuation of this thought. But he says, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. And then Peter goes on to talk about those false teachers and some of the things that they would do destructive to the faith of Christ. When you get down to verse number 20, verse number 19, look what the Bible says of these false teachers. It says, while they promised them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled thereunto, therein rather, and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Look at the illustrations that Peter is going to utilize to refer to that person who has succumbed to false teaching in this particular context and has returned from his obedience to the gospel to the pollutions of the world. This is what the Bible says about him. The Bible says in verse number 21, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness then after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them but as it has happened unto the, but it has happened unto them rather according to the true proverb the dog is turned to his own vomit and the sound that is washed to a wallowing in the mire and so those are the illustrations that Peter will utilize to refer to someone who has obeyed the gospel, who has tasted the salvation of God to see that it is good, and then abandon those things to go back into the world. He's describing people that have stepped outside of their minds. He's describing people who are not thinking clearly. He's describing people who, whose thoughts are not coherent and in harmony with the word of God. What needs, to be, what needs to happen in that case? Well, number one, someone needs to be, there needs to be a restoration of senses. There needs to be a restoration of senses. And so whenever this young man, according to this, this uh, parable, is out in the world, and whenever he is about righteous living, the Bible says, look, there's a restoration of a sense when he came to himself. When he came to himself. Sometimes people have to hit rock bottom. Whenever we're living in the world, whenever we've abandoned Christ, sometimes we have to hit rock bottom. In the book of Proverbs chapter 13, I think there are verses 15 and 16, the Bible says that the way of the transgressor is hard. And it's intended to be that way. That's the way God has designed this thing. I think about some other passages of Scripture that convey this thought. Be not deceived, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That is the way God has designed life. He's designed life for there to be consequences of bad behavior. And that is to gain the attention of the one who is engaged in that type of behavior, especially one who's walked away from God so that he might have the motivation and the incentive to return. You know, we think about the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we talk about church discipline. And the Bible says there are some things that God has expects us to manufacture. Now, again, the, the law of seed time and harvest tells you that if you sow to the wind, you'll reap the whirlwind. Whatever you sow, that you're going to reap as well. But God says even where the church is concerned and where people who have wandered away from the truth are concerned, God expects us as the body of Christ to manufacture even more adversity for that person. Yes, that's what the Bible says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we've got a, a man that is engaged in the sin of sleeping with his father's wife. A horrific sin. That Paul says is not so much as named among the Gentiles. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And so the congregation there, rather than lamenting over this situation, they become puffed up. And so Paul says, I got a problem with you that you have not handled this thing the way that it's supposed to be handled. Well, how is it supposed to be handled? Paul says, you should have put this guy away from you. You should have delivered him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That's what the Bible says. And so what did he effectively say? He says that we who are faithful, whenever one of our brethren has wandered away and will not return, that we are even to be participants in the creation of the adversity that is designed to give them the motivation to come back to the Lord. That's what it's for. 
to give them the motivation to come back to the Lord. We understand it's for the purity of the church as well. The Bible says in the same passage of Scripture, we know that this is divine punishment. We see in the same passage of Scripture, but it's also for the sake of them being able to, to miss the fellowship that they once enjoyed and be able to come back. God is desirous once men wander away of them being restored to their senses. And so the Bible says when he came to himself. We talk about what are the components of repentance. Number one, a restoration of the senses. But if you continue to read there in verse number 17, the second part of it, he says, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger. And so he's come to his senses as he's sitting there, hovered over that trough in which hogs are being fed. And he's desirous to eat of the husk that he's feeding to those hogs. I, I mean, I, I remember doing some things like that. My grandmother lived out in the country in the sticks. When we were growing up, she's passed on now, but she lived out in the sticks. And so that was one of the favorite things that we would do over the summers. We'd go out and stay a couple of weeks with my grandmother. And of course, if you went out to stay with my grandmother, slopping hogs was going to be a part of, of what you were engaged in. All right. And so, you know, I, I wasn't from where she was from. And so being around hogs wasn't something I was altogether comfortable with at first. But, you know, once it's said and done, you, you get comfortable with that. But, you know, I remember she had this old five gallon bucket that she would keep, Brother Chris, <laughs> in the kitchen by the doorway. And no matter what we were eating, you know, all of her grandbabies or her, father, her husband was dead. <clears throat> Grandfather had passed away even before I was born. But all of her grandbabies there, we'd eat and she'd fill, you know, feed us and do things like that all throughout the day. Whatever you had, you just threw in that bucket. <clears throat> threw in that bucket. And so there'd be red Kool-Aid in the bucket, man. There'd be, like I said, husk from rinds from melons. There would be bones from meat and all types of junk. Soggy bread. It'd just be nasty looking. And we'd take that thing out there and we'd throw it to that trough. Well, Jason had squirt everywhere and, and the pigs just absolutely loved it. So as he's bent over that type of thing, looking at that, wanting to eat that because he's so hungry, the Bible says he comes to his senses. But then also, number two, the Bible says there's a recollection of blessings whenever someone is away from God. There needs to be a restoration of senses Number one, there needs to be a recollection of blessings. As he's about to eat that, he, he comes to us and he says, look, my father's servants. Now, he is his father's son. He says, my father's servants have enough to eat. And here I am perishing with hunger. I mean, if we take this particular section of this parable and we look at it from a, a uh, maybe a, a more literal perspective, we go over to places like the book of Matthew, chapter 5, where Jesus Christ is is in the, the midst of the Sermon on the Mount. And what does he say at the end about his father? Of course, Christ is, is uh, dispelling some hermeneutical myths and problems that the Pharisees have had, the scribes and the Pharisees have had. That's why he says back in verse number 20, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means or no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so he begins to talk about how the, the scribes and the Pharisees had interpreted the word of God. He says six times you have heard it said by them of old times, and he would give you the common uh, interpretation of the scriptures that was given by the scribes and the Pharisees through their oral traditions. But then he would say, but I say unto you, and then of course he gives you the proper interpretation. Well, there at the end, he says in verse number 43, you have heard that it's been said that thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. That was a misinterpretation. It was a misinterpretation. He says, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be children of your Father which is in heaven. Listen to this. He says, for he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. I used to misunderstand that passage of Scripture thinking that it was punishment, that second clause there. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. I, I thought that was a punishment, but the dink, I, I played baseball when I was younger, and, and I remember, man, whenever it would rain, it's time for the game, and I just lament the fact that it was raining, man. I thought that was a punishment. So whenever the Bible says Christ, uh, God sends rain on the just and the unjust, I thought that, you know, that means that good people get punishment just like bad people, but it literally means the exact opposite of that. Rain is a blessing. Rain is a blessing from God, and he sends that blessing not only on the righteous, but on the wicked. Not only on the just, but on the unjust. And so this young man, as he is over this pig trough, about to eat some of the slob that he's feeding to these hogs, 
he remembers the blessings of his father. I am my father's son, and his servants have more than enough to eat. There needs to be a recollection of blessings. Man, when we notice Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, as Jesus Christ is, is addressing the seven congregations of Asia, the first one that he addresses is the Ephesian congregation. The congregation there in Ephesus, and he's got so many good things to say about this congregation. They are doing a wealth of good works. And so he commends them before he condemns them. And he says this, he says, I know thy works, verse number two, and thy labor and thy patience and how thou cannot bear them, which is evil, which are evil. And thou hast tried them, which say they are apostles and are not, and you have found them liars. So these guys are doing what the Bible says to do. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 21 to 22, test all things, prove all things, Hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every appearance of evil. They're doing what 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 and 2 say. Try the spirits, whether they be of God, because there are many false prophets who have gone out into the world. They've done that. Verse number 3, and, they, and thou hast born, and hast patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. And so he says that here's a problem that I've got with you. You have left your first love. Whatever they are doing, they are not doing it at, at this point according to the motivation by which they should be doing it. It's not because of love for God. Sometimes people get in a rut. Sometimes things religiously become ritualistic. And they're not doing it because of their devotion to God, because of their love for Christ, because of their appreciation of what God has done for us. But they're doing it simply because it's become habitual, because it's become ritualistic for them. That's a problem for God, obviously, according to what we see here. What is the remedy for that problem? What do we do about that? People need to know, don't they? Because this happens often in the church. What do they need to do? Christ's remedy, the prescription that he gives them, verse number five is remember. It's to remember. Remember, therefore, from whence thou hast fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come quickly unto thee, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thy repent. Man, whenever serving God becomes mundane, my friends, what we need to do is recollect. We need to take our minds back and remember what it is that Christ has done for us. If it ever becomes ritualistic to you, if it ever becomes compulsory to you, I encourage you to go back and read passages of Scripture like Psalm 22. Go back and read passages of Scripture like Isaiah 55. Go back and read portions of Scripture that talk about what Christ has done for us. Go to the end of the Gospel accounts and see what Christ has done for us. And that will solve that problem. Recollection of his blessings. This young man recollects who he is. And from whence he's come, he says, that I remember. And then we see the third component here. Number one, it's been a restoration of his senses. Number two, a recollection of his blessings. Number three, a recognition of sin. A recognition of sin. Verse number 18. He says, I will arise and go to my father and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Whenever we have walked into sin and we begin to live in sin, we are no longer in the light, but in the darkness. The Bible tells us that one thing that needs to happen, that must happen, is a recognition of sin. Recognition of sin. We've seen this occur in congregations. I'm not saying here. I've not, not been here long enough to, to see that. And I'm sure you probably because of the, the fine eldership that's been here for so long, that wouldn't occur here. But I've been in places where I've seen people who have been away in sin just kind of slide back into the, to the pews. Just kind of slide back in, try to be inconspicuous, maybe sit at the back. Not saying anything about you guys that are sitting in the back, but I'm saying, you know, that sometimes you kind of slide in, sit at the back. They're, they're in after the service starts. They're out before the services are over, and they don't want to be noticed. They don't want to be noticed. They want to continue to do that week in and week out to eventually people become desensitized to that. And my friends, that is not how repentance works. It's not how it's supposed to work, and we certainly shouldn't recognize it as working that way. The Bible says recognition of sin is absolutely imperative. When I've gone into sin, I must be willing to recognize that I have sinned. The Bible tells us as much in the book of 1 John chapter 1 as well, doesn't it? Of course, John is talking there about walking in the light versus walking in darkness. And what are the blessings of being able to walk in the light? That is that we have a continual cleansing of the blood of Christ if we 
follow the conditions that he's given to us. All right, he tells us what we have to do there, verse number 9. If we say that we have no sin, verse number 8, we deceive ourselves and truth is not in us, verse number 9. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of, of all unrighteousness. So if we meet the conditions that the Lord has set before, sometimes we refer to it as the second law of pardon, then the Bible says God's blood will continue to cleanse us of our sins. But if we walk away from the light, the Bible says we don't have any such fellowship. What do we need to do in order to regain that fellowship? Of course, we've talked about repentance, and that's what we're talking about here. But the Bible says recognition of sin is most ne definitely necessary. Recognition of sin, a, willing to repent, a willingness to admit that we have sinned. Confessing our faults, James chapter 5 teaches us. And so he comes back and he says, I'm going to say to my father, Look, Father, I've sinned before thee and against heaven. And once he gets back, he does exactly what it is that he says he's going to do. We're in the fourth place, what do we see repentance entailing? Number four, a return to righteousness. So he contemplates what he needs to do. Look, he's restored to his senses. He recollects his former blessings. Blessings. He recognizes his sin, and he follows through with that. Follows through with that. He doesn't just think about it. He follows through with it. He doesn't talk about this is something that needs to be done. He follows through with it. And so he recognizes, or excuse me, he returns to righteousness. Notice verse number 20 and 21 as we draw to a close. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. He returns to righteousness. But in conclusion, Remember, this whole parable has been about the response of the righteous to the return of the sinner. And notice what the Bible says about that return in verse number 20 and 20, 23 and 24. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. This is what the Bible says. We know how the rest of the story goes. The older son, he becomes disgruntled because of this. And he's rebuked by the father for him being disgruntled. But at the end of the day, verse number 32, he tells his son, it is meet that we should make Mary and be glad for this. Our brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. My friends, if you wandered away from our Lord, from the flock of God, the Bible tells us God is faithful. He's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is that father in his parable who is waiting for us to return home. And we can do that through biblical repentance. And once one repents biblically, my friends, every last one of us, again, it is necessary. It is incumbent upon us to open up our arms and to receive the loss that is returned with open arms, with rejoicing and gladness. This morning, if you're here and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation to obey the gospel initially, we implore you to do that. If you need to return home, then we encourage you to do that as well. As together we stand and sing.